So Carrie, this is the total truth. Almost every time I take a fruit sticker off a banana, I think of you. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. You are not the only one. That is so weird. Week, I've had people talk to me about fruit stickers all week. <laughs> was that what from, the- was that from Gorilla Art? I couldn't remember. Um, no, it's from Rec, I think. Oh, it's from Rec this journal. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God. That's funny. It really is. When I was, you know, when I think about people that I want to have as a guest, I think about people whose, you know, work has meant something to me, whether it's in the last month or for you. I mean, years and years ago, I don't know how I found you when I started getting those emails that you used to send when, ah. you know, they were kind of like little poems, sensory yeah. poems. Right. Yeah. And my daughter and I have some amazing memories of making gorilla art, which is one of your books. When she was in high school, we would um, go around town. And one time we left little post-it notes everywhere with little messages to people and hid them over our, all around our little town. Another Aww. time we did chalk art. So just a little, you've, you've been a really great creativity mentor for both of us. So I wanted to thank you for that. Oh, I love that. Yeah. As I know you have for millions and millions of people. (laughs) (laughs) It's so funny because now there's been like a whole generation that has grown up on a wreck and gorilla art kid. And so it's kind of interesting to see, and they still write me. It's like, there's, it's still like this thread throughout their lives, you know? So that is awesome. So we should oh, give yeah. listeners just a little context about your work. Do you still consider yourself a conceptual artist? Yes. Yes. Oh my God. First and foremost. And it's funny because that, that sort of has grounded me and made my work more playful because I don't see the book as a static object. As you know, <laughs> the book is for me, it's, it's kind of just a vehicle, but it's also this sacred object that I pay homage to over and over again in different ways. And I've been obsessed with books my whole life, but particularly books as an object, you know, as a sacred object. Now I'm, I'm pushing it further as I do my work in the last year into uh, book as object, but now book as sacred object. What does that mean for myself? You know, that's, that's my play where I'm playing right now. Yeah, let's go there. But first, let's just back up for a second because people are going to be like, what is a conceptual artist? (laughs) You know, people are going to wonder, you know, can you can you explain your version? That doesn't have to be a textbook version, of course. What was Oh, yeah. Did I jump out? Did you not hear me? I jumped out a little bit there. Okay. So my question was, let's explain to people a little bit what a conceptual artist is. Ah, okay. My definition would be where the idea is more important than the presentation. That's kind of how I define it, where we're the conceptual artist is led by ideas and concepts, and they will explore those in as many different ways as possible. And my, the thread that runs through my work is that I am always looking at something from as many different angles as possible, whether it's a tree or a book or whatever, it's just, that's how I work. <laughs> yeah. You know, I feel like when I look at your body of work, it has such a feeling of cohesiveness. It feels very unified. Like I think of those as like signature themes. They're, these ideas are these ways of creating that we, we keep modifying or playing with in different ways that we can't quite get away from or, or fulfill. Oh God, I know. I just, uh, I just sent a manuscript to my editor I've had the same editor the whole way through. Wow, that's so unusual. I know, isn't it? And like her and I are like two peas in a pod and I can't imagine doing my work without her. But she said, like this, the new book I just submitted, she said, all the themes are still there, but they're presented in a new way. And so I was like, I'm not even aware of that. (laughs) I don't think we are aware of it. Sometimes I look back and I'm like, could you get a new idea? Could you talk about something different? (laughs) Right. And don't you feel like you're stating the obvious over and over, right? But then people come to me, the the readers come to me and they say, oh my God, this was like totally new for me. And I was like, really? Because to me, it's like old hat, you know, but it's really interesting that way. You can't see your own work body of work very well no no you can't now let's go back to book a sacred object 
Yeah. And, and this new book and how you're pushing it in a new direction. Like, what do you mean by that? Well, the book has a, the main theme, the concept is of time. And I was paying it, I was, I was researching ways in which technology was affecting us negatively. And it's so funny because the last year we've been relying on it so heavily to connect with people. And so it's been amazing for that. But I've been focusing on the ways where it hasn't been good. And so when you look at the internet and social media, everything is about the new. We're, we're very focused on the thing that is in the moment of the moment. And that mm -hmm. thing rushes by. If you can look at it like uh, a rushing stream and that stream of information is just going and going and it never stops. And so it's almost impossible for us to inhabit time when we're online. And so I've been really focused on how do we inhabit time? And one of the ways to slow that rushing stream is to really sink ourselves into the, something that I would define as a ritual. So what a ritual involves is this idea of repetition. And it is through repetition that we can actually inhabit time and slow things down. And what we have lost on the internet is that, se that, that, that sense of completion that mm -hmm. we get, right? Because scrolling newsfeed never ends. No, and our brain, why it's so engineered with, and this is, you know, they did this on purpose, not maybe nefariously in the beginning, but they can, some people continue it nefariously. Mm -hmm. Facebook, I'm looking at you. And <laughs> that, that is that it's our dopamine receptors. They want something new. I mean, yeah, they want, and we can't overcome that. That's the way our brains are built. Right. We have, but the thing about that fascinates me about ritual and completion, I'm like my whole body just kind of went, Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Because what we are, what I'm talking about is called a negative feedback loop, right? And so our nervous systems were not prepared for this amount of like, we are, we are built to experience completion, <laughs> right? And we need it. We need it. And so through this whole last year, I had to test my own medicine like never before, <laughs> as we all have. And so I just dove headlong into a journaling practice based on obviously not sharing, <laughs> because it, this is another concept I'm working with is the idea of not sharing. Everything used to be so personal, and now everything is just what happens to us when everything is all out there. It is not good, right? We need private space for contemplation, right? And this is the theme that I'm, I've been working with all year. And what happens when we sink in and are able to inhabit time, then we have space to discover what our souls are really speaking about and what they're asking for, right? And I feel like with my own internet addiction, I sort of have come through the other side now, because as you mentioned earlier, I'm, <laughs> I am not online. I have removed myself almost. You really have, because I was, you know, I mean, I've known your work. And as I alluded to a few moments ago, for a long time, we've been yeah. connected personally. And, and when I always go and do a deep dive before I do an interview, I'm like, what have you been, especially people like, I, I don't want to ask the same questions, right? This yeah. to me is an art form. And mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I'm eliciting the best of you for my, for my listeners. And I'm like, wow, I really can't find very much. <laughs> no, I've done nothing. Uh, I did a uh, exploration of the day when this was an Instagram feed, when the pandemic started. And that was because I had so many teachers writing me. It started off in Italy, a bunch of Italian teachers wrote me and said, cause it, if you remember, the pandemic started in Italy. It was really bad. Everybody was completely on lockdown. Yeah. And so, and I have a close friend in Italy too. And so <laughs> it was, it was very intense because it was like, you could watch what was going to happen here. Mm -hmm. And we were worried about that. Right. And so all these teachers said, okay, we're all in lockdown 
and I need something for my kids to do. Can you help? And so I started coming up with a new activity every day to try and like, you know, give them something to do. And so that was good. It was like, I was coming out after being hidden for so long. But for me, what happened over the years was I started to feel a growing sense of toxicity online in the online world. I got a lot of hate mail. I got a lot of negative stuff and I couldn't really understand it at first. But now that I've had time to look back, the internet turns us into sort of a pack mentality. And there's a bit of an anonymity with it. And so people are not afraid to be really nasty on there. And I just felt like I'm getting tired of, of dealing with, with people who are just, and I don't know why, like maybe because my work is so, um, I'm not about being super positive all the time. I, I like to be real, but I don't know. It's it's kind of interesting that. It's a question for me. In season one, we had the poet Kate Bear, who has an uh, interesting relationship with the internet and her second book of poetry of blackout poems from positive and negative messages that she got either as emails or DMs or things. And so we talked a lot about that, but her poetry is super feminist. It's super so you could see where guys and trolls and, you know, patriarchal bullshit right. would happen, but yeah. your work is all about play and yeah. seeing a new and wondering a new neighborhood and yeah. random chance encounters with your creativity. Totally. Right. And, and what's you know, to hate about that? You could just say not for me, but yeah, I don't know, but I, yeah, I definitely had some trolls that were really harsh to deal with and so mm -hmm. basically I pulled out completely and it's been weird because we are trained as a culture that if we don't produce and the internet really fosters this belief if we, if we do not produce we will fail or what happens if you are not in that current news feed and I started to see this overproduction or this push to produce in all areas of our culture. I was seeing it, my son was finishing elementary school and we had to go and look at middle school. And I saw it in middle schools and how, oh my God, these poor children couldn't, like compared to what I had as a child, they are pushed, they have to compete, right? So they're thrown into this world of like, you have to be in extracurricular groups. You have to perform in soccer, whatever, you know, it is. And it was just glaring to me that we are turning our children into producers, right? Produce, 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 produce for Instagram, right? And now our personal lives, our leisure time is commodified and up for approval, <laughs> Okay. Right. That, and that I, I find, I mean, it's, in, it, I was telling you before we started, and this probably will still be true when this airs that I get, I got kicked off of Instagram about six weeks ago for saying the word vagina, 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 vagina. I can say it on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and my, my creative team behind me is like, Hey, you got to go back on because no one's going to know about the podcast and no one's going to know about what you're doing. And I'm like, I don't know if that's true. And yeah. I'm looking at what's different for my life when I'm not on social media and it's pretty profound. Oh my but, God. I but know. I'm clearly going to pay. I'm clearly going to have to design my business differently if I decide to stay with us. And I don't know what I'm going to decide or what I'm going to do. Totally. But, and you know, there are other options that, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to explore those too. Like what, like, like what? You know, like newsletter, a newsletter is more intimate, right? Mm -hmm. And it's targeted to a specific group of people who are already your fans, mm -hmm. right? So I feel like that is much more personal and I respond more. And actually that's how I started. I used to have this. Yeah, you did. That's how yeah. I, I think that's maybe how we found each other. I don't remember. Yeah. And I had one that uh, I started off with a snail mail one in the very beginning. Oh, I maybe because I had those wish jar cards. You must have been on the mailing list then, right? Because that yes. th that was way before even I published. So anyway, it, it's that is something that we all can look at and say, do we need this? Do we need this constant pressure 
to produce. It is not healthy for us. It was not healthy. When you see it in a 13 year old, yeah. So my son was having anxiety when he was in school. We've pulled them, my kids out of school since the pandemic and he was having anxiety. And we were like, we couldn't figure out why he seemed fine, but it would happen in the middle of the night. He'd have these panic attacks. And I think there was this pressure to produce in grade in the sixth grade. Right. And if it's starting that young, we have to question that because in my mind, in sixth grade, you're starting to move out of childhood and go into adolescence, but you need to re retain space to play and space to give your time self to think. And this is where my, all my thinking came from of this last year of like, if you don't, don't provide space, so I believe that our goal as human beings is to figure out our own private uniqueness. What is that? And I stole that term from John Taylor Gatto, but who are we, right? And so, you know, in older times <laughs> and when we were kids, we had so much space. We had time to play. There was downtime, there was boredom you know, and that's a big theme throughout culture now is boredom. But when you provide space, then you can start to hear what your soul is telling you, like things that you really need. Right. And it so, seems essential for create creating. I mean, what I notice in myself is that because I've been producing, whether it's books or, or teaching content or a weekly newsletter slash blog or that it really, it really can lead to creative burnout because you don't have the yeah. time to do what I imagine you do, which leads me to a question, which <laughs> is spend days exploring and following an idea, whether you're reading a book and then it leads you to another book. And it's, a, it's exactly the experience you give us in all of your books or, or journals or the postcard book or the gorilla art book, they're all about following. You're giving us things to follow and build on. And right. that's what I imagine your personal creative process is like. Yeah, that's, that's exactly my daily <laughs> existence, right? Is that, it, and in the last year, it's been very slow, right? Because I'm doing it alone. And it really essentially, I wander. I wander through my days and let one thing lead to another. And there, it's often extremely simple, but that simplification has allowed my, whoops, my camera just died. <laughs> I can still see you. Okay, good. I can see you. It's okay. I'm just going to leave it like that. This is probably better because you're not as big. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. We don't want me big. Don't, don't, no, 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 not a big face. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, what was I saying? Okay. So like it, the simplicity of what I've pared my creative process down to. So one of the things that I've added to this experience is I'm pushing the journal, the, the journaling or the daily journaling into a ritualistic place. And that is something that I hadn't really thought about much before, but so that's where the journal itself, I started making kind of accessories for my journaling practice. So I'm in the process right now of making a quilt, which is just like a, a one cedar quilt that you take with you, it's portable, and you go out into the world with it. And so that creates this repetitive thing that is something that feels sacred. And so it's turning the journaling practice into something that is bigger than you that's kind mm. of what it feels like mm. uh, and i don't you know i didn't grow up in a religious with a religious background and so you know my family's not religious at all but i think it's i i'm seeing the value now in those rituals that people who go to church have these beautiful things that and so we can take some of that and implement it. I, I really believe that that counteracts the negative effects of social media and the internet, mm -hmm. you know, for that. ourselves. Right. I love that. I, I want to 
ask you about wandering through your day though, because one of the things that a lot of the people I work with, writers and creatives in general, complain to me about, come to me for, is that they wonder too much and nothing gets done. And they do want to produce stuff. They do want to finish stuff, complete stuff. And they mm-hmm. find themselves not, you know, starting something new, getting lost in the middle. So is there a way to balance that wondering? Or do you think that's just a more sophisticated way of creating that some of us gain enough self-trust to do? Or do you think it lends itself to your particular style of being a conceptual artist? I mean, I can only speak from my experience, but I feel like the pressure to perform is what makes us feel kind of shame, mm-hmm. some kind of shame about produce, make a product. Yeah. And it, like, if you're not doing some, if you're not in the process of be, trying to be successful, then you're not working hard enough. And I think that is more damaging to me anyway, right? Like when I start to start to worry about what are other people doing that's the thing that that really gets to us right Mm -hmm. it's like comparing ourselves to others uh i have you know over the years come to understand like that is a really negative force for creative people and so you need to do everything you can to cut all that out Mm -hmm. (laughs) right like for me like not being on instagram I don't have it as much as I used to. It's true because you just don't see it. (laughs) it, Right. I'm not looking at the people going, wow, she's doing so well. And I'm, you know, what am I doing? I'm like, and it's been hard. Like, so every creative person I know when the pandemic started, we just, I know that the New York times calls it languishing, but I went into this, like, it's, it was like being stuck in mud and not being able to do anything. I couldn't work really. I, my work, I went back to my roots, which is like with Rectus Journal, right? Where I'm barely, barely writing in the journal every day. And if I wrote a little bit, even a sentence, it was like an accomplishment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I, I just allowed myself that, you know, say like, we're going through something really big let's just, let's just be in it and not criticize myself at all. And that's really been, that was so helpful. Yeah. But I still, you know, occasionally I'd get this, like that critic saying, Hey, you need to work. (laughs) Right. And so I did, I, I, I did, I was doing work all the way through, but it was so hard to get to the, the, the page, you know? Do you, and when we talk about comparison and product and all of this, I mean, you've had tremendous success. I mean, Wreck This Journal has sold how many copies? The last count, last I heard, we were at 16 million. 16. Yeah. <laughs> in print, not sold. Six, 16 million copies in print. And that's just one of how many books have you written? 16? 12? Yeah, I don't even know. I lost track. Yeah, <laughs> lost track. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. I've lost track too. I'm like, what do you consider a book, really? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, some of those are those really books. So is it easier for you to let go of creating in that same pace and being out in the world? Because you're like, look, I've had a huge impact. I, I've made some good money. I, I've taken, I've ta- I've inspired 16 million people plus all the other books. Or does yeah. it put more pressure on you? Neither. Yeah, the publishing world sometimes puts pressure on you to create the same thing that you had success with. And, sure. and that's a real trend. And I knew that a long time ago, but so I don't, I don't pay any heed to that whatsoever because my books are about my personal process. Every single book that I put out is about something, some stage of my life where I'm struggling through. And all of it is the teach that which you most need to learn. So, you know, when I wrote Wreck This Journal, I had just gotten married. And I had, in order to do that, I had to sort of destroy my old life, and it crumbled. And so it was this deconstruction period, right? And then later on, we had Explorer, and that was about starting to build things up again and really take heed, pay attention to awareness. What are we taking in every day? So anyway, it's just about my personal process. I can't really worry about, you know, that pressure to succeed. And also, you know, now the writing process, you cannot force it. It has to feel 
like there's like this life energy to it. If you don't have that, you have nothing, you know, because what people respond to in a creative work is that energy that you have in creating it, right? So if you're feeling electrified as you're writing, that's what people want, that's what people respond to. If you're writing something and it just is not working and it feels terrible, I, I just feel like there's not an electric charge to it, you know? Yeah. Um, I, Although I, I will say that I can have the electric charge in the first draft or maybe even the second draft, but sometimes by the third or the fourth, there's not a lot of electric <laughs> charge. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And but I know it was there in the beginning. <laughs> right. Right. And that's the most important thing because, yeah. but you know, you've looked at it so many, so times. many times you get so tired of yourself. So yeah. your husband really has played an important role in <laughs> your creativity. And there's this great oh, yeah. story about he and a friend were dancing with headphones on somewhere to get unstuck. And then he got you to do it maybe on a city street. I wasn't yeah. quite sure. And well, you said we were- this was really important. And, and the reason I ask, Carrie, is because to me, the thing that keeps drawing me back to you, I think why I think of you when I take a fruit sticker off, you know, and stick, <laughs> it, stick it in the inside of the, the garbage. I know it's not that I think of you in garbage, but you and fruit stickers. Yeah, that's um, okay. I like that. Okay. Is because I feel like one of my biggest issues in life, which is why I do this podcast, is to that have that freedom that you, that you try to have and that you bring to us in your books. And I, I struggle with that. I struggle with that letting go and that going into the unknown so much. And it seems yeah. like that dancing story was a pivotal, pivotal moment for you. Oh my God. Was it ever? I mean, <laughs> yeah. to explain, cause I didn't explain it very well. Explain to people what well, it was. Well, I mean, you can Google it. It's, I believe it's on YouTube still. It's called the winter of the dance, the winter of the dance. Yeah. And that, it, that'll give you a really good sense of my husband and yeah. the way that he lives. But so we, I lived in Northern Canada, uh, two hours North of Toronto in an area that has the m- most incredible amount of snow. It's called Lake effect snow anyway. So I married my husband and he had just bicycled across the United States. And then we were getting married at the end of that trip. And it was really kind of intense, but so he was with his best friend and they both moved into my house when they finished the journey and they're from California (laughs) and had, and they asked me like, what's the weather? Like I said, (laughs) fine, you're going to love it. It's going to be great. (laughs) I had no idea because I'd never lived in California. I can't, I'm from Canada. I don't know. And so they showed up and it was really hard for them to see for me. I didn't even realize that at the time I have my own creative world in my head that I retreat to all the time. And so I'm fine. You can leave me anywhere. I'll be good. (laughs) But they were also very physically active. And so when the snow hit and, and that place, like we don't live there anymore because they couldn't handle it, but it averages in the winter. I mean, the average would be minus 15 Celsius, but often it would get to minus 25 anyway. So, and you'll see that if you watch the film, because Mike says in it, this is the coldest air I have ever been in, in my life. And so they start, I don't even know how they got the idea, but they started dancing on the street corner in this small town. They would put on headphones and they would go into that kind of world and just Mm -hmm. let it all hang out. Right. Just like, bleh. And so when, the, when it first started, I thought, oh, this is great. It's like a, a conceptual art piece, right? Which it was. And then over time, I started to question it a little bit. Like, was it about being sort of voyeuristic or not voyeuristic, but like, you know, trying to show people that you're interesting or yeah, or cool or whatever. Yeah. And, and so I was worried about that, you know, and you can hear me questioning them in the film. So basically they recruited me to, they said, you got to come and try this. Right. And so what I realized when I did it was that it pushes you so quickly into like a place of feeling uncomfortable, you know, performing (laughs) in a public space. 
And this was a small town where I knew everybody, right? So that made it even worse for me. But what I realized was it pushed, pushed you right through your fear zone of that, right? And so that had the effect of like, at some point you have to not care at all what people are going to, mm. and that was really hard. It was hard for me because, but I had this image of myself as being really daring at that time. And then I realized like, no, I, I'm not, you know? So anyway, that it was a beautiful thing too, because you really, it's almost like meditation in a way, if, if you've ever done intensive meditation and you get to a place where the ego just tr drops away mm -hmm. it, and it doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, it's like, oh, this is really freeing. I don't have to care who I am anymore. And that's a, also what I've been writing about a lot lately is a lot of the things that we've grown up with culturally, they may or may not be true. You know, things like that your parents have said, you need to do this, you need to go to school, you need to be successful. I, I think we're not questioning those things enough in our culture. Mm -hmm. And we're not questioning culture itself and its influence on kids in particular. Now we're starting to some, you know, th this week they're talking about how Instagram is negatively impacting. Especially young um, girls. Young girls, mm -hmm. right. And it's, it's that we need to really look at mm -hmm. what are we creating right so anyway it's <laughs> what a journey <laughs> that but i do recommend watching the film because it's only it's really short it's like five minutes but it's life-changing <laughs> so someone who's listening who says you know this all really resonates with me but how do i even how do i begin to free myself i mean forget dancing on the side of a street yeah. corner in my That's small extreme. town in the winter, but like, yeah. how do I even let myself go with words or, or with color? You know, you, you wrote somewhere, someone interviewed you and you were talking about your process. And you said, at first I played around with not controlling the medium as much, letting ink wonder and roll around the page, adding water, dropping things. Then it evolved into letting work become altered by outside influences, weather, et cetera, letting the work be influenced by the place I was working in. And you went on from there and that became the basis for Wreck This Journal. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that every one of your books is an invitation to, to let go and see where that takes you? Is that, is that what we do? Do we start with your books? I mean, how do we do it? How do we start to let go some yeah, I mean, of our so control? That that's where the indeterminacy and the chance comes in right the john cage influence in your own yeah work. because yeah. that that allowed me to remove the ego mm. right but i didn't and, and so and this gets back to sort of the repetitive stuff too is whatever we can do to remove the ego and start to have a practice of creativity because that gets us in the the habit of not caring right? It's kind of, I feel like not caring. That's brilliant, Carrie. The yeah, habit of not caring. It's kind of like a muscle, right? Mm -hmm. So if you do it in really small ways at first, that's where the journaling is really helpful. Then it sort of translates to the bigger things in life. That's where it gets like kind of exciting, right? Where it's like you practice just moving the pen at first you know, and when I was doing the exploration of the day, I came up with this idea called boredom drawings, because, and, and it's just repetitive motion. And some of them are really simple, where you have to draw diagonal lines on a page, and try you get as close as you can to the line you just drew, but not touch it. It's really hard to do, like, it, it sounds really easy, but it's very meditative, you know, and then by the end of it, you feel like, wow, I have this kind of beautiful, these beautiful lines. And like, if you did it 10 times, they're all kind of different, you know? So anyway, pl playing with this kind of practice where it's not about the finished piece, right? It's about the process of just like playing around and experimenting. And so I'm not interested in whether you make something that looks beautiful at all. In fact, like, a lot of times, because I get sent wreck this journal from people who have done finished them. And the ones I like are the ones where people really let loose <laughs> and like 
I, I don't like the ones that look so decorative, you know? I saw some on YouTube where people had turned them into art pieces. And I was like, wow, that's not what we did. <laughs> it looked yeah. like nothing when we were done. I don't know. I mean, we never even finished it. I never oh even thought God. about finishing it. I'm like, oh, I don't like that one. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I feel like if you do it correct, well, I shouldn't say correctly. There's no correct way to do it. But if you do it in the way that I intended, there should be a little bit of mold on it. You know? <laughs> there might be the dog might eat it yeah <laughs> my I dog has so. taken to eating books this morning she ate another Aww. book or puppy and my and bob said my husband said i knew she was smart but <laughs> <laughs> she's really taken in the books so that's good my dog is right here with me too you've been obsessed with books your yeah. whole life you worked in a bookstore for different bookstores for years what does that look like right now? Like, what do you, how, how do you decide what to take in and how do you, how do you, how do you read? Oh my God. I read constantly obsessively. I feel like this last year, the fiction has been so good for me. me too. Like, oh, it's been my retreat. My kids too. We've all just gone crazy. So what I did was when the pandemic started, and I know this is totally coming from someone who, you know, I have money, I'm privileged. I decided because we were not going to do school, we could order as many books as we wanted without guilt, right? <laughs> so that's, that's what we were going to spend most of our money on in the last year. And that's what we did. And it, it, it felt a little reckless at first, right? Because normally like you go out and you're like, okay, I can only get one book, right? <laughs> Which and book I should said, be? <laughs> right. And so I said to the kids, like, let's just do it. This is like a dream I've had my whole life. It's like, <laughs> me, too, me too. I'm so glad you did it. I'm living vicariously through you. Yeah. It's like, so we just went crazy. We ordered books. We, we fled to Nova Scotia, which is another long story. I have, we have a family cottage there and I have a health condition that makes me more susceptible to COVID. And so we were freaked out. I was like, I cannot get this because I don't know what's going to happen. Right. Anyway, so we went to Nova Scotia and it's really small town there. And so the, the town where we live in there has a bookstore that delivers to your house. <laughs> and I was like, this is my dream, you know? So anyway, I just went crazy with fiction. The fiction was just so wonderful. And it puts you into a state, it puts me into a state of being aware of the smallest little things in your surroundings, you know? It's like you become hyper tuned in to things and the way that people write. And, and poetry does this as well, right? It's like just tuned into smells and, and sounds and everything. It, so the whole year has been a very sensual kind of experience. And I started daydreaming about this idea of having a library in the woods because I, we were in the woods most of the time. And for some reason, this image is still like resonating with me. So I feel like I need to create one somehow. <laughs> it's like, I would need a library in the woods. I don't know oh, what that I see. I see a new project in that somehow that's, I that's, know there's something really interesting there. I don't know how to do it though, because of the mold problem. But so I did an installation last year. Was it? No, God, two years now. So it's like we lost a year. Yeah, right? I know. I, I keep doing that too. And it was at this place in upstate New York called Olana, which is the old the house of the painter Frederick Church. And so I did this installation based on the Wander Society and it was a tent that you could go into and there was all this paraphernalia and there was like books in there and all the famous wanderers, there were photos of them and it was really fun to do. I'd never really done that before in, in, in such a big way, but it was a very interactive piece too. You could go in and I had this machine that was like an oracle and so you would click on it and it would spit out like a prompt for you to do when you're out on the, in the woods there. So yeah, I can see, I want to do more sort of installation work like that at some point. That's going to be <laughs> what my focus is in the future. Oh, that's fantastic. I'll never leave books behind, but I, I, I like this idea of interactivity. Although now with COVID, I don't know. <laughs> If well, eventually, 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 we'll yeah. to... so there's a couple of places there I want to go. 
tell me about the wonder society. Tell me about Walt Whitman. Tell me about, do you still wonder daily? Yeah. And that's I with mean, an A everybody. I have, I have that little bit of accent. Wonder. <laughs> wonder. Yeah. I can't yeah, say the difference between A and O is very well. <laughs> yeah. So I became obsessed with Walt Whitman and he was just very grounding force. And, you know, I'm Canadian. I'm not American. So I didn't grow up with any of him. Where I live here, I'm not in Nova Scotia right now, by the way, but I'm by Amherst, Massachusetts. And Emily Dickinson is there, her her house. And so that's interesting, too. Like, I, I started to get into the poetry. I never really been hugely into poetry because I felt like I didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. That's so and true for so many people. And then I realized at some point that you don't need to understand it. In fact, it was actually my son who said this. He was like six years old and he said something to the effect of, mama, you don't need to understand poetry. You just need to feel it. And Love I was it. like, oh, I couldn't believe that he got that. You know, like he really got that in his body at six years old. And I was like, that's it right there. And that's, that's it for so many things. It's like, we need to feel things in our body. That's another thing that our culture is not good with, which is embodiment, mm -hmm. right? And sinking into the body and really like activating our senses all the time. That's the thing that makes us feel alive. And we're, you know, being online all day, we're losing that, right? So it's like, no, you got it. Every time, like, I start to feel like I, I'm not doing well emotionally. It's like, I just need to go out, sink into nature. And it's so easy too, right? Just mm -hmm. going outside, touching trees and like smelling everything. And like, so the senses are the way back to <laughs> ourselves. Mm -hmm, very true. And, and, and neurobiologically true as well. But tell us about the Wonder Society and tell us about that project so that we'll understand the, the installation. Then I want to ask you how you made the installation because I'm fascinated by that. Yeah. So the Wonder Society is a book that I did, which was based on this self-organizing group, underground um, movement of people who were wandering. And the whole point to it is that you wander with no purpose. So it's not just about like going for long walks. It's, it's about engaging in a task that has no purpose and no final outcome. And so listening to our intuition while we're doing it, going out and saying, okay, what direction do I move in right now? And saying like, what does my soul want me to do? And so it's really kind of that simple. And it's, <laughs> I think it's definitely for introverted people who want to connect with others but there is this group aspect to it where you can so there is a secretive facebook group that meet or that writes regularly and that's kind of a big part of it too that it keeps changing and altering on its own it's got its own life to it you know all, all of your books do i mean the record yes. journal does and gorilla art i mean they all they go out in the world and become what they're going to become through people yeah, doing I, it I feel like they're separate from me. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like I'll start this and they are all a collaboration with, I call them users, not readers, but, you know, so people take it and that it's, it's kind of like we, we do something together. I give you the initial like breath and then you take it, see where it goes for you. And everybody has their own responses to it. So no outcome is ever the same. It all changes, you know, it's, it's yeah, the essence beautiful. of creativity. Yeah, I, I got, you know, initially the idea was from the writer Umberto Eco, and he wrote a piece called The Open Work. And that was him talking about, I believe it was like writing, being a collaborative thing with the reader, because we all bring our own associations to things. Mm -hmm. And so it's quite beautiful in that way. I love it. So when you made an installation for the first time, like, can you take us through, because the, the, that what came up for me was, how did you envision that? Or how did you find the stuff? And how did you build it? I think yeah. that would be really instructive for our, our listeners who have ideas and then get stopped about how do I actually do it? Yeah. So I had this book, The Wander Society that I had created. And then I started to think about, I have to create an entire world. What does that look like? 
And this is uh, where I'm working with the journaling as well. This is the same concept. You get to create your own world. What does that look like for you, right? And so you create, um, you know, you can create like, like a, a logo or something that represents the, the piece. And then you create for the Wander Society, creating literature to, for, for that world. And then I had to create this physical space. What would that look like? So I got this canvas tent and then I built inside. It looked more like I, there might be photos online somewhere. It looked more like a cabin because I put wood on the inside. And then I had photos of Walt Whitman and all the, the writers and wanderers. And then it was very much something that you had to go in and explore yourself and sort of come to your own sort of conclusions about uh, what was this thing? Why was it in the middle of the woods? <laughs> how did like, and that you would happen to get there. It. Yes. How did it get right. there? Yeah. I love it. I love and it. And then I had like the people who would come to visit we had all these little strips of fabric that they would sign and put quotes on. And so we had strips of fabric everywhere, like just colored, they were sort of red and yellow and it was quite beautiful. And that part of it, it was interesting. Cause I didn't, I mean, I, I put the stuff there for people to do and then people just made it. It, it ended up like, you know, becoming its own thing, you know, just like your books. Yeah. And then we had a lot of, we had like camps and workshops around it too, where people were making journals and it was, it was really fun. Um, it was so much work, but in the end, it didn't feel like much because it just happened naturally, you know, organically. So it's, it's like the theme for you. The thing that charges me up is creating worlds, mm -hmm. you know, and like everything what I've been doing with the journaling right now is like making accessories for the journaling and stuff like that. And, and like the quilt, the quilt is an accessory. The quilt and, and, you know, making my own logos for, I, I call them logos, but that sounds like too businessy, but it's like another term is a personal ensign, which is like a symbol that represents you. Right. And then we're using that repetitively. It's, it's like, um, so I'm, now I'm creating this whole world around myself. Like, what am I into, right? And really pushing that. I, I taught a class at uh, Emily Carr University for a in year. Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, this is basically my course <laughs> where I had, I really, we all started with a long list of all the things that are interesting to you. What are you into, right? And then we take that list and we work from that to create a, a world, whatever that is. And because it was an illustration class, it's like you would create illustrations around it. Or what if you wanted to create a company around it? Whatever you wanted, it could be anything. And so just really starting to pay attention to what you are responding to as a human being. Hmm. And that's where all the, the juice lies, right? All of my work comes out of that. I love that because it really in in a way it's so simple. And, and yet I think it's so complicated because so often a lot of our listeners are women or people who identify as women and we don't give ourselves time and permission to pay attention. Yeah, it, to, to the simplest things, mm -hmm. right? To what, to what we wanna make our world out of, right. our creative world at this time. And we don't get, and this is a theme that comes up with a lot, I ask this a lot of our guests, and we don't give ourselves permission to change, to go, okay, I'm done with that. And now yeah. I get to move on. And now that, that, and yeah, there'll be things I take without even knowing it. Like you have, like we were talking about signature themes, but that I let myself keep growing. Yeah. Right. And like, I think a lot of times we get bogged down with all of this external stuff. Right. And then that becomes the thing that's leading us. But what we really need to do is go inside. I mean, this is partly, you know, where I am in my life too, at my age. It's, it's an age where they say you start to go internally more. And so I think that could be partly the influence, but where I'm starting to really, really look at what I'm into and, and separating the, the self that has been created over the years. Right? And that's hard to do when that self has had a lot of success. Can yeah. be harder. Can be harder because yeah. everyone wants Carrie Smith who makes wreck this journal, who makes 
right. you know, the wonder society who makes gorilla art kit. But I put her, I'm putting her down. <laughs> right. Well, like, with mercy, with mercy. <laughs> yeah. Because that is a, a fabrication, yeah. right? That is a, a something that also was formed from other people, mm -hmm. not myself, right? Because mm -hmm. you know, when you have any kind of success, people meet you and they want to, they have an idea of you already, right? I always feel it's really disappointing to meet me in person. <laughs> me too. I know, no, I have that too, because I'm introverted, right? Now I present as extroverted, right? So that's, that's nice. It's good to have because people go, wow, she must be fun. I'm not that fun. <laughs> I know, <me laughs> like I'm not a partier, right? Yeah. <laughs> I love to read my books in bed. That's what I like to do. Oh my gosh. I like, yeah, I like to exercise, you know, but it's all like, I'm not out there that much. And my work is out there. My work is very loud but I am not, I'm very quiet and insular. I'm okay with that now. I've come to terms with that. But yeah, it is kind of disappointing when you meet someone. <laughs> You're like, wow. Or they got... expect you to be more wise than you are. I don't know. Yeah, I yeah. And they expect you to say things that are profound, right? <laughs> but, so so anyway. pa pass the salt. And that is why I don't do much, right? Like I don't, I, I honestly do not do public engagements. I don't really do podcasts, you know, once in a while I'll come out of my shell and I'll do them, but it has to be someone that I know, or like, <laughs> you know, well, my, I appreciate, I appreciate you come out of the shell for this really very my, much. My publisher, I'm like the worst like a publisher's nightmare for promotion. Right. So this is picture the meeting, right? You have the meeting and uh, they sit you down and there's like a whole table full of people and they're like okay we're going to talk about promoting your new book and I'm like I would like to talk about how we can not promote this book right like let's look at it from a conceptual standpoint right it has to feel natural you know and I don't know if you've had this experience but a lot of marketing in today's time backfires like crazy because publishers send out free copies to like influencers or whoever right these people don't care about you or your work right they have no they they might not even like it my book I have I've had so many bad reviews from people who got free copies and I'm like why would you think that you that person would like my book you know you have to find the, the readers or the people who respond to your work, that's who you focus on, you know? And yeah. like, those are the people, it, it's like either you, are, you hear what I'm saying and you respond to it or not. And anybody else, it doesn't matter. I don't need, you know? So I don't read reviews anymore. I don't even, because it's not good. For no, it's that. not good. Reviews are hard. I, I Reviews are hard. They're very, they're good to avoid for sure. Yeah, I know. So Carrie, I have this last question that I ask everybody. And I feel like for you, I'm going to have to say, you can only tell me three things. <laughs> <'Cause this> question, <laughs> you're going to love this question so much. What, what do you want to learn next? Oh, wow. <laughs> oh God. I love that. Gosh, this is a good question. It's a big question. It is a big question. It could be the whole interview with you. <laughs> Well, okay. So this is what's interesting. Like, so one of the things I do in my journal is what I call my research. And that, that is like just personal research of things that I'm interested in. And I'll take like a theme and then I'll follow that. And then I'll find books related to that. And then, you know, it's like, it's this sort of meandering, beautiful thing that continues all throughout my work. Give me um, an example of a theme that you would notice and I mean, so my books turn into them. Okay. Right? So uh, the one that I worked on in the last year, I, I started by researching the negative impacts of social media and the okay. internet. And so I was started going down that path and, oh, it was so amazing. Cause I, I would have these explosions of insight of like, where I was learning it, it's affecting our nervous systems really negatively. Right. Because anyway, this is another tangent. I know <laughs> 
ready to answer the question. Um, They're all really interesting tangents. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm obsessed with philosophy. And so I want to sort of continue down. I, I, I'm looking for contemporary philosophers. The one I've been obsessed with in the last year is Byung Chul Han, and he's in Germany. He's Korean and he's really amazing. And that's where I'm getting a lot of my ideas. So I'm stealing <laughs> some of his, he talks about the rushing stream and finding a sense of home within time. So yeah, so that's philosophy is the one thing that I'm obsessed with. I've been trying to explore magic, mm. not, not magic in a, a magician sense, but magic, what is magic for me, you know, and it, in the last year, it's been like a nature based things that caught I've been really into this word exaltation, what causes exaltation, right? When we were in Nova Scotia, we were down on a beach. And one night, my daughter said, it looks like there's something sparkling down there in the water. And I was like, that's weird. So my son threw it was dark, my son threw a rock in. And it was the bioluminescence, which I'd never experienced before. It's incredible. I did once in oh. the Caribbean. Yeah. Yeah. And it like, that was life-changing for us. <laughs> we were just yes, like, it's we true. Those magic moments. I can think, I remember swimming in the dark in the Caribbean with some oh. people. We, we were on a boat going between islands and we saw it and we all just got in the water and I'll never forget that. Yeah. The, the, so those kind, that kind of magic where you're experiencing something that is like so huge, you mm -hmm. know? And then like contrast to that, some of the things that create magic for me are the simplest too, right? Like just finding a stone that I really enjoy for the day and like touching that. I've been really into textural things, a toothy paper in my journal. And so I, I only work in journals that I make myself now. So that was kind of a new thing in the last few years. So experimenting with toothy paper and, and really simple materials. So the kids and I have been make, try, like learning to make ink and materials and paint brushes. So that's something I'm still kind of learning about. That's really fun. And I'm always, I, I'm a knitter. So I've been, God, did I ever knit this year? <laughs> <laughs> I did stress knitting, you know, because it, and knitting is very repetitive too. So there's that ritual mm -hmm. and it has a calming effect. It, it calms me immediately. It's just so wonderful. So anyway, those are things I've been learning about and thinking about. Carrie, it has been so much fun to just wander around in your head. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, just, I'm so grateful that you wrote. It's good for me to come out of my shell. <laughs> I'm glad you came out of your shell for us. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Jen.